Now, I have some questions that could be answered uh, by either one of you. For example, how do you decide what projects to work on? Do you have autonomy in your lab to work on whatever you want? Or is someone telling you, this is what we want and this is what we're going to fund? How does that work? Either one of you or both of you could answer that. Uh, maybe I can go first. Um, so uh, this is uh, really good about being a professor. Um, so we can uh, choose the topic we would like to work on. So when I uh, try to think about what to choose, um, often that time it comes down to uh, what's the problem I want to solve. You know, I, I look into what's the most important problem the whole world is facing, whether through engineering, through technology, particularly through materials design. I can solve those problems. If I have a great idea, I'll pick those problems to work on. And I would just add that for me, I also uh, enjoy having a great team to work with. So when I also look at and try to identify which problems do I think are most important and that I can contribute to meaningfully, um, because my work does rely so heavily on collaborators at the medical school, I will often look around and see, okay, how can I assemble the best research team here on campus? Um, and that also helps to guide my research direction. Now this field is so new, I would think that you would need a lot of very special tools and equipment to do this work. Uh, do you have to invent all those tools yourself or is somebody else doing that? Um, for my research, uh, I tend to use a lot of large share facility. Those equipment cost million dollars, multi-million dollars. Uh, Stanford University has been really good in uh, purchasing the tools to uh, satisfy the faculty's needs. So uh, I benefit tremendously from the investment in, in the university. And for some of the tools, we also uh, build our own. So it's a combination of both. Okay. What's the most difficult part of the research? What are some of the biggest problems you have to conquer or challenges you have to face in order to get the job done? So I think part of it is breaking it down into manageable chunks and figuring out how can my skill set contribute to really solving this problem. So as an example, we have a new project um, that's a collaboration with Professor Giles Plant in neurosurgery at the uh, Stanford Medical School. And he's very interested in spinal cord injury. That's a huge problem. And so what what part can I do as a material scientist to help uh, tackle that problem? And how can I design a question that is a true testable hypothesis so that I'm not just going out and trying lots of different variables. I have a clear understanding of the project and I'm trying to decide, ah, can I design an experiment to test that hypothesis so even if my experiment fails, someone else can learn from my results and the whole field can benefit from that. So is it kind of like what Thomas Edison said, 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration? You get a few good leads and then you keep eliminating the things that don't work until finally something does? Yeah, that's pretty much true, yes. <laughs> we try a lot of things probably that don't work. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> now you're both members of this Gabal Laboratory for Advanced Materials. Uh, what, what, is that, what does membership in the Gabal Laboratory bring to you that enhances your work? So this lab is a highly in interdisciplinary lab. It indeed consists of uh, faculties from multiple departments try to tackle the problem of uh, focus on materials, new materials to uh, uh, you know, solve big problems. So uh, uh, if you look at the, you know, what type of faculties in there, there's pe people from material science, there are people from physics, applied physics, from also other engineering department. Uh, uh, it's called, at Stanford, it's called independent research laboratory. And it's, uh, you know, try to break the department uh, boundary to bring different expertise together to solve a big problem. What's the most satisfying part of your work? I guess it would be when something works when it's supposed to. It does. It's always fun to have an experiment work. But I would say it's equally fun when an experiment maybe doesn't quite work, but it yields some surprising data. Um, because then that's when you really gain some new insight into how, 
how the laws of physics and chemistry are combining together to really make this material function. So it's more the surprising data that I wasn't expecting um, that, that for me that, is the most true. satisfying yes. part. Right. Because yes. you're not just doing engineering, you're doing basic research. Yeah. Yeah. You're looking into the basic properties of matter at the nanoscale level. And what you discover maybe will determine what yeah. direction you're going to go into yeah. next. Yeah. I also add a little bit, uh, in addition to this uh, very exciting research surprise, uh, our profession, uh, one important uh, goal is to educate students and postdocs. Um, so uh, our product, not only the research, the technology, but also the people we develop, that's uh, very exciting as well. That's a, a big uh, source of uh, satisfaction. Now, speaking about graduate students and postdocs, uh, I've heard that there aren't enough Americans going into science, and maybe we need to find ways to encourage more young people to take an interest. Uh, is there anything you do in your lab that could give insight into how this can be made an attractive career choice for uh, children still in elementary school? So I don't go out to elementary schools, but I do um, occasionally go and visit high schools. Um, and give seminars, um, tell them about um, some of the current advances being made in material science and how bioengineering can be used to uh, help cure diseases and injuries and try and relate it back to what they're learning in their high school geometry and chemistry and physics classes. There are a lot of concepts that high school students are learning that we're applying every day in our research. And I think when you make those connections, that can help get them really excited about the idea of considering engineering or science as a major in college. Well, I understand some of your work also involves stem cells, which are very important. These are cells that have not yet differentiated or become specialized, and maybe you can make them specialize in what you want them to specialize in. Uh, what kind of work are you doing in that area? Yeah, so for a lot of um, regenerative medicine applications, stem cells are a potential source of new cells that we could use to uh, replace uh, damaged or diseased tissue. Um, and so we work carefully with stem cell biologists to try and understand what those cells are capable of doing, how can we do it safely, how can we do it ethically, and of course my, my own area is how can I design a material that will give the stem cell some instructions so that it knows what to differentiate into, that is it knows what type of functions it should be doing. And I think you've also done some other interesting work with batteries. I read that uh, you created a battery made out of paper and ink which is actually pretty successful at storing electricity. And when you crumple it up, it still works. That's right. How does uh, that work? So, uh, you know, for, for a while, we really try to develop the battery that's uh, flexible. You can bend, you can crash, and then make sure they don't break. Uh, but the battery also needs a liquid electrolyte. So uh, a paper turned out to be really interesting substrate material. You can put materials on. They stay right there, just like the ink. When you write on the paper, how the ink stay on the piece of paper. So we can uh, put the battery materials on paper, they stay strongly, and put them together. We know paper can be folded, can, can, you can do all kinds of crazy things, they won't break. Uh, uh, that's how the whole idea comes from. Uh, it turned out to be uh, working really well. Yeah. We just have about a minute left. Uh, do you feel you have all the resources you need to continue this work indefinitely? Do you see a pretty uh, bright path? through this, or is, uh, is there any risk that you know, maybe the people who pay for this will run out of money at some point? So uh, I would say, well, it's been, uh, this society has been very uh, supportive, but certainly uh, now in, in, in the United States, the uh, funding support is uh, not as strong as uh, before. So to do the science and engineering, so I would say if the investment can be make uh, more, then this whole area will grow even better. Okay. And on that note, we're going to have to wrap. I'd like to thank both of you for being here today, Professor Yi Chui, Professor Sarah Hileshorn, both from uh, Stanford University. Thank you for watching. Visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman. We'll see you next time.